Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Chapter 6, Of Paternal Power, Sections 52 to 60. Section 52. It may perhaps be censured as an impertinent criticism in a discourse of this nature, to find fault with words and names that have obtained in the world. And yet possibly it may not be amiss to offer new ones, when the old are apt to lead men into mistakes, as this of paternal power probably has done, which seems so to place the power of parents over their children wholly in the father, as if the mother had no share in it. Whereas, if we consult reason or revelation, we shall find she hath an equal title. This may give one reason to ask whether this might not be more properly called parental power. For whatever obligation nature and the right of generation lays on children, it must certainly bind them equal to both the concurrent causes of it. And accordingly, we see the positive law of God everywhere joins them together, without distinction, when it commands the obedience of children. Honor thy father and thy mother. Exodus 20.12 Whosoever curseth his father or his mother. Leviticus 20.9 Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father. Leviticus 19.3 Children, obey your parents. Ephesians 6, 1, is the style of the Old and New Testament. Section 53. Had but this one thing been well considered, without looking any deeper into the matter, it might perhaps have kept men from running into those gross mistakes they have made about this power of parents, which, however it might, without any great harshness, bear the name of absolute dominion and regal authority when under the title of paternal power it seemed appropriated to the father, would yet have founded but oddly, and in the very name shown the absurdity, if this supposed absolute power over children had been called parental, and thereby have discovered that it belonged to the mother too. For it will but very ill serve the turn of those men who contend so much for the absolute power and authority of the fatherhood as they call it, that the mother should have any share in it. And it would have but ill-supported the monarchy they contend for, when by the very name it appeared that that fundamental authority, from whence they would derive their government of a single person only, was not placed in one, but two persons jointly. But to let this of names pass. Section 54 Though I have said above, chapter 2, that all men by nature are equal, I cannot be supposed to understand all sorts of equality. Age or virtue may give men a just precedency. Excellency of parts and merit may place others above the common level. Birth may subject some, and alliance or benefits others, to pay an observance to those to whom nature, gratitude, or other respects may have made it do. And yet all this consists with the equality which all men are in, in respect of jurisdiction or dominion over one another, which was the equality I there spoke of, as proper to the business in hand, being that equal right that every man hath to his natural freedom, without being subjected to the will or authority of any other man. Section 55. Children, I confess, are not born in this full state of equality, though they are born to it. Their parents have a sort of rule and jurisdiction over them when they come into the world, and for some time after, but it is but a temporary one. The bonds of this subjection are like the swaddling clothes they are wrapped up in, and supported by in the weakness of their infancy. Age and reason as they grow up loosen them till at length they drop quite off, 
and leave a man at his own free disposal. Section 56. Adam was created a perfect man, his body and mind in full possession of their strength and reason and so was capable, from the first instant of his being, to provide for his own support and preservation, and govern his actions according to the dictates of the law of reason which God had implanted in him. From him the world is peopled with his descendants, who are all born infants, weak and helpless, without knowledge or understanding. But to supply the defects of this imperfect state, till the improvement of growth and age hath removed them, Adam and Eve, and after them all parents were, by the law of nature, under an obligation to preserve, nourish, and educate the children they had begotten, not as their own workmanship, but the workmanship of their own Maker, the Almighty, to whom they were to be accountable for them. Section 57 the law that was to govern Adam was the same that was to govern all his posterity, the law of reason. But his offspring, having another way of entrance into the world, different from him by a natural birth, that produced them ignorant, and without the use of reason, they were not presently under that law. For nobody can be under a law which is not promulgated to him. And this law being promulgated, or made known by reason only, he that is not come to the use of his reason cannot be said to be under this law. And Adam's children, being not presently as soon as born under this law of reason, were not presently free. For law, in its true notion, is not so much the limitation as the direction of a free and intelligent agent to his proper interest, and prescribes no farther than is for the general good of those under that law. Could they be happier without it? the law, as an useless thing, would of itself vanish. And that ill deserves the name of confinement which hedges us in only from bogs and precipices. So that, however it may be mistaken, the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For in all the states of created beings capable of laws, where there is no law, there is no freedom. For liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be where there is no law. But freedom is not, as we are told, a liberty for every man to do what he lists. For who could be free when every other man's humor might domineer over him? But a liberty to dispose and order as he lists, his person, actions, possessions, and his whole property, within the allowance of those laws under which he is, and therein not to be subject to the arbitrary will of another, but freely follow his own. Section 58. The power, then, that parents have over their children arises from that duty which is incumbent on them to take care of their offspring during the imperfect state of childhood to inform the mind and govern the actions of their yet ignorant knowledge, till reason shall take its place, and ease them of that trouble, is what the children want, and the parents are bound to. For God, having given man an understanding to direct his actions, has allowed him a freedom of will, and liberty of acting, as properly belonging thereunto, within the bounds of that law he is under. But whilst he is in an estate wherein he has not understanding of his own to direct his will, he is not to have any will of his own to follow. He that understands for him must will for him, too. He must prescribe to his will and regulate his actions. But when he comes to the estate that made his father a free man, the son is a free man, too. Section 59. This holds in all the laws a man is under, whether natural or civil. Is a man under the law of nature? What made him free of that law? What gave him a free disposing of his property according to his own will within the compass of that law? I answer, 
a state of maturity wherein he might be supposed capable to know that law, that so he might keep his actions within the bounds of it. When he has acquired that state, he is presumed to know how far that law is to be his guide, and how far he may make use of his freedom, and so comes to have it. Till then, somebody else must guide him, who is presumed to know how far the law allows a liberty. If such a state of reason, such an age of discretion, made him free, the same shall make his son free, too. Is a man under the law of England? What made him free of that law? That is, to have the liberty to dispose of his actions and possessions according to his own will within the permission of that law. A capacity of knowing that law, which is supposed by that law, at the age of one and twenty-one years, and in some cases sooner. If this made the father free, it shall make the son free too. Till then we see the law allows the son to have no will, but he is to be guided by the will of his father or guardian, who is to understand for him. And if the father die, and fail to substitute a deputy in his trust, if he hath not provided a tutor to govern his son during his minority, during his want of understanding, the law takes care to do it some other must govern him, and be a will to him, till he hath attained to a state of freedom, and his understanding be fit to take the government of his will. But after that, the father and son are equally free as much as tutor and pupil after knowledge, equally subjects of the same law together, without any dominion left in the father over the life, liberty, or estate of his son whether they be only in the state and under the law of nature, or under the positive laws of an established government. Section 60 But if, through defects that may happen out of the ordinary course of nature, any one comes not to such a degree of reason, wherein he might be supposed capable of knowing the law, and so living within the rules of it, he is never capable of being a free man. He is never let loose to the disposure of his own will, because he knows no bounds to it, has not understanding its proper guide, but is continued under the tuition and government of others. All the time his own understanding is incapable of that charge. And so lunatics and idiots are never set free from the government of their parents. Children who are not yet come unto those years, whereat they may have, and innocents which are excluded by a natural defect from ever having. Thirdly, madmen, which for the present cannot possibly have the use of right reason to guide themselves, have for their guide the reason that guideth other men which are tutors over them, to seek and procure their good for them, says Hooker all which seems no more than that duty which God and nature has laid on man, as well as other creatures, to preserve their offspring, till they can be able to shift for themselves, and will scarce amount to an instance or proof of parents' regal authority. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Chapter 6, Of Paternal Power, Sections 61 through 68. Section 61. 
Thus, we are born free, as we are born rational. Not that we have actually the exercise of either. Age, that brings one, brings with it the other, too. And thus we see how natural freedom and subjection to parents may consist together, and are both founded on the same principle. A child is free by his father's title, by his father's understanding, which is to govern him till he hath it of his own. The freedom of a man at years of discretion, and the subjection of a child to his parents, whilst yet short of that age, are so consistent and so distinguishable that the most blinded contenders for monarchy, by right of fatherhood, cannot miss this difference. The most obstinate cannot but allow their consistency, for were their doctrine all true, were the right heir of Adam now known, and by that title settled a monarch in his throne, invested with all the absolute unlimited power Sir Robert Filmer talks of, if he should die as soon as his heir were born, must not the child, notwithstanding he were never so free, never so much sovereign, be in subjection to his mother and nurse, to tutors and governors, till age and education brought him reason and ability to govern himself and others? The necessities of his life, the health of his body, and the information of his mind would require him to be directed by the will of others, and not his own. And yet will anyone think that this restraint and subjection were inconsistent with or spoiled him of that liberty or sovereignty he had a right to, or gave away his empire to those who had the government of his knowledge? The government over him only prepared him the better and sooner for it. If anybody should ask me when my son is of age to be free, I shall answer just when his monarch is of age to govern. But at what time, says the judicious hooker, a man may be said to have attained so far forth the use of reason as suffices to make him capable of those laws whereby he is then bound to guide his actions. This is a great deal more easy for sense to discern than for anyone by skill and learning to determine. Section 62 Commonwealths themselves take notice of and allow that there is a time when men are to begin to act like free men, and therefore, till that time, require not oaths of fealty, or allegiance, or other public owning of or submission to the government of their countries. Section 63. The freedom then of man, and liberty of acting according to his own will, is grounded on his having reason, which is able to instruct him in that law he is to govern himself by, and make him know how far he is left to the freedom of his own will, to turn him loose to an unrestrained liberty before he has reason to guide him, is not the allowing him the privilege of his nature to be free, but to thrust him out amongst brutes, and abandon him to a state as wretched and as much beneath that of a man as theirs. This is that which puts the authority into the parents' hands to govern the minority of their children. God hath made it their business to employ this care on their offspring, and hath placed in them suitable inclinations of tenderness and concern to temper this power, to apply it, as his wisdom designed it, to the children's good as long as they should need to be under it. Section 64 But what reason can hence advance this care of the parents due to their offspring into an absolute arbitrary dominion of the father, whose power reaches no farther than by such a discipline as he finds most effectual to give such strength and health to their bodies, such vigor and rectitude to their minds, as may best fit his children to be most useful to themselves and others, and, if it be necessary to his condition, to make them work, when they are able, for their own subsistence. But in this power the mother too has her share with the father.
Section 65. Nay, this power so little belongs to the Father by any peculiar right of nature, but only as he is guardian of his children, that when he quits his care of them, he loses his power over them, which goes along with their nourishment and education, to which it is inseparably annexed. And it belongs as much to the foster father of an exposed child as to the natural father of another. So little power does the bare act of begetting give a man over his issue, if all his care ends there, and this be all the title he hath to the name and authority of a father. And what will become of this paternal power in that part of the world, where one woman hath more than one husband at a time? Or in those parts of America, where, when the husband and wife part, which happens frequently, the children are all left to the mother, follow her, and are wholly under her care and provision. If the father die whilst the children are young, do they not naturally everywhere owe the same obedience to their mother during their minority as to their father were he alive? And will any one say that the mother hath a legislative power over her children? That she can make standing rules, which shall be of perpetual obligation, by which they ought to regulate all the concerns of their property, and bound their liberty all the course of their lives? Or can she enforce the observation of them with capital punishments? For this is the proper power of the magistrate, of which the father hath not so much as the shadow. His command over his children is but temporary, and reaches not their life or property. It is but a help to the weakness and imperfection of their knowledge, a discipline necessary to their education. And though a father may dispose of his own possessions as he pleases, when his children are out of danger of perishing for want, yet his power extends not to the lives or goods which either their own industry or another's bounty has made theirs, nor to their liberty neither, when they are once arrived to the enfranchisement of the years of discretion. The father's empire then ceases, and he can from thenceforwards no more dispose of the liberty of his son than that of any other man, and it must be far from an absolute or perpetual jurisdiction from which a man may withdraw himself having license from divine authority to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. Section 66 But though there be a time when a child comes to be as free from subjection to the will and command of his father, as the father himself is free from subjection to the will of anybody else, and they are each under no other restraint but that which is common to them both, whether it be the law of nature or municipal law of their country. Yet this freedom exempts not a son from that honor which he ought, by the law of God and nature, to pay his parents. God having made the parents instruments in his great design of continuing the race of mankind, and the occasions of life to their children, as he hath laid on them an obligation to nourish, preserve, and bring up their offspring, so he has laid on the children a perpetual obligation of honoring their parents, which containing in it an inward esteem and reverence to be shown by all outward expressions, ties up the child from anything that may ever injure or affront, disturb or endanger the happiness or life of those from whom he received his, and engages him in all actions of defense, relief, assistance, and comfort of those by whose means he entered into being, and has been made capable of any enjoyments of life. From this obligation no state, no freedom can absolve children. But this is very far from giving parents a power of command over their children, or an authority to make laws and dispose as they please of their lives or liberties. It is one thing to owe honor, respect, gratitude, and assistance, another to require an absolute obedience and submission. The honor due to parents, a monarch in his throne owes his mother, and yet this lessens not his authority, nor subjects him to her government.
Section 67. The subjection of a minor places in the father a temporary government, which terminates with the minority of the child. And the honor due from a child places in the parents a perpetual right to respect, reverence, support, and compliance, too, more or less as the father's care, cost, and kindness in his education has been more or less. This ends not with minority but holds in all parts and conditions of a man's life. The want of distinguishing these two powers, namely, that which the father hath in the right of tuition during minority, and the right of honor all his life, may perhaps have caused a great part of the mistakes about this matter. For to speak properly of them, the first of these is rather the privilege of children and duty of parents than any prerogative of paternal power. The nourishment and education of their children is a charge so incumbent on parents for their children's good that nothing can absolve them from taking care of it. And though the power of commanding and chastising them go along with it, yet God hath woven into the principles of human nature such a tenderness for their offspring that there is little fear that parents should use their power with too much rigor. The excess is seldom on the severe side the strong bypass of nature drawing the other way. And therefore, God Almighty, when he would express his gentle dealing with the Israelites, he tells them that though he chastened them, he chastened them as a man chastens his son. Deuteronomy 8.5 That is, with tenderness and affection, and kept them under no severer discipline than what was absolutely best for them, and had been less kindness to have slackened. This is that power to which children are commanded obedience, that the pains and care of their parents may not be increased or ill-rewarded. Section 68. On the other side, honor and support, all that which gratitude requires to return for the benefits received by and from them, is the indispensable duty of the child and the proper privilege of the parents. This is intended for the parent's advantage, as the other is for the child's. Though education, the parent's duty, seems to have most power, because the ignorance and infirmities of childhood stand in need of restraint and correction, which is a visible exercise of rule and a kind of dominion. And that duty which is comprehended in the word honor requires less obedience though the obligation be stronger on grown than younger children. For who can think the command, children obey your parents, requires in a man that has children of his own the same submission to his father as it does in his yet young children to him? And that by this precept he were bound to obey all his father's commands if, out of a conceit of authority, he should have the indiscretion to treat him still as a boy. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Chapter 6, Of Paternal Power. Sections 69 through 76. Section 69. The first part, then, of paternal power, or rather duty, which is education, belongs to the father, that it terminates at a certain season. When the business of education is over, it ceases of itself, and is also alienable before. For a man may put the tuition of his son in other hands. And he that has made his son an apprentice to another has discharged him, during that time, 
of a great part of his obedience both to himself and to his mother. But all the duty of honor, the other part, remains nevertheless entire to them. Nothing can cancel that. It is so inseparable from them both that the father's authority cannot dispossess the mother of this right, nor can any man discharge his son from honoring her that bore him. But both these are very far from a power to make laws, and enforcing them with penalties, that may reach a state, liberty, limbs, and life. The power of commanding ends with knowledge, and though after that honor and respect support and defense, and whatsoever gratitude can oblige a man to, for the highest benefits he is naturally capable of, be always due from a son to his parents. Yet all this puts no scepter into the father's hand, no sovereign power of commanding. He has no dominion over his son's property, or actions, nor any right that his will should prescribe to his sons in all things. However, it may become his son in many things, not very inconvenient to him and his family, to pay a deference to it. Section 70 A man may owe honor and respect to an ancient or wise man, defense to his child or friend, relief and support to the distressed, and gratitude to a benefactor to such a degree that all he has all he can do cannot sufficiently pay it. But all these give no authority, no right to anyone, of making laws over him from whom they are owing. And it is plain, all this is due not only to the bare title of father, not only because, as has been said, it is owing to the mother too, but because these obligations to parents, and the degrees of what is required of children, may be varied by the different care and kindness, trouble and expense, which is often employed upon one child more than another. Section 71 This shows the reason how it comes to pass, that parents in societies where they themselves are subjects, retain a power over their children, and have as much right to their subjection, as those who are in the state of nature which could not possibly be if all political power were only paternal, and that in truth they were one and the same thing. For then, all paternal power being in the prince, the subject could naturally have none of it. But these two powers, political and paternal, are so perfectly distinct and separate, are built upon so different foundations, and given to so different ends, that every subject that is a father has as much a paternal power over his children as the prince has over his, and every prince that has parents owes them as much filial duty and obedience as the meanest of his subjects do to theirs, and can therefore contain not any part or degree of that kind of dominion which a prince or magistrate has over his subject. Section 72 Though the obligation on the parents to bring up their children and the obligation on children to honor their parents, contain all the power on the one hand, and submission on the other, which are proper to this relation. Yet there is another power ordinarily in the father, whereby he has a tie on the obedience of his children. Yet the occasions of showing it, almost constantly happening to fathers in their private families, and in instances of it elsewhere being rare, unless taken notice of, it passes in the world for a part of paternal jurisdiction. And this is the power men generally have to bestow their estates on those who please them best. The possession of the father being the expectation and inheritance of the children ordinarily, in certain proportions according to the law and custom of each country, yet it is commonly in the father's power to bestow it with a more sparing or liberal hand, according as the behavior of this or that child hath comported with his will and humor. Section 73 This is no small tie to the obedience of children. And there being always annexed to the enjoyment of land a submission to the government of the country of which that land is a part, 
It has been commonly supposed that a father could oblige his posterity to that government of which he himself was a subject, that his compact held them. Whereas it being only a necessary condition annexed to the land which is under that government, reaches only those who will take it on that condition, and so is no natural tie or engagement, but a voluntary submission. For every man's children being by nature as free as himself or any of his ancestors ever were, may, whilst they are in that freedom, choose what society they will join themselves to, what commonwealth they will put themselves under. But if they will enjoy the inheritance of their ancestors, they must take it on the same terms their ancestors had it, and submit to all the conditions annexed to such a possession. By this power, indeed, fathers oblige their children to obedience to themselves, even when they are past minority, and, most commonly, too, subject them to this or that political power. But neither of these by any peculiar right of fatherhood, but by the reward they have in their hands to enforce and recompense such a compliance, and is no more power than what a Frenchman has over an Englishman, who, by the hopes of an estate he will leave him, will certainly have a strong tie on his obedience. And if when it is left him, he will enjoy it, he must certainly take it upon the conditions annexed to the possession of land in that country where it lies, whether it be France or England. Section 74 To conclude, then, though the father's power of commanding extends no farther than the minority of his children, and to a degree only fit for the discipline and government of that age. And though that honor and respect, and all that which the Latins called piety, which they indispensably owe to their parents all their lifetime, and in all estates, with all that support and defense is due to them, gives the father no power of governing, that is, making laws and exacting penalties on his children. Though by this he has no dominion over the property or actions of his son, yet it is obvious to conceive how easy it was, in the first ages of the world, and in places still where the thinness of people gives families leave to separate into unpossessed quarters, and they have room to remove and plant themselves in yet vacant habitations, for the father of the family to become the prince of it. He had been a ruler from the beginning of the infancy of his children, and when they were grown up, since without some government it would be hard for them to live together, it was likeliest it should, by the express or tacit consent of the children, be in the father, where it seemed, without any change, barely to continue, and when, indeed, nothing more was required to it than the permitting the father to exercise alone in his family that executive power of the law of nature which every free man naturally hath, and by that permission resigning up to him a monarchical power whilst they remained in it. But that this was not by any paternal right, but only by the consent of his children, is evident from hence, that nobody doubts but if a stranger, whom chance or business had brought to his family, had there killed any of his children, or committed any other act, he might condemn and put him to death or otherwise have punished him as well as any of his children, which was impossible he should do by virtue of any paternal authority over one who was not his child, but by virtue of that executive power of the law of nature which, as a man, he had a right to. And he alone could punish him in his family where the respect of his children had laid by the exercise of such a power to give way to the dignity and authority they were willing should remain in him above the rest of his family. Section 75 Thus it was easy and almost natural for children, by a tacit and almost natural consent, to make way for the father's authority and government. They had been accustomed in their childhood to follow his direction, and to refer their little differences to him, and when they were men, who was fitter to rule them? Their little properties and less covetousness seldom afforded greater controversies, and when any should arise, where could they have a fitter umpire than he by whose care they had every one been sustained and brought up, and who had a tenderness for them all? It is no wonder that they made no distinction betwixt minority and full age, nor looked after one and twenty, or any other age, that might make them the free disposers of themselves and fortunes, 
when they could have no desire to be out of their pupillage. The government they had been under during it continued still to be more their protection than restraint, and they could nowhere find a greater security to their peace, liberties, and fortunes than in the rule of a father. Section 76 Thus the natural fathers of families, by an insensible change, became the politic monarchs of them too. And as they chanced to live long, and leave able and worthy heirs for several successions or otherwise, so they laid the foundations of hereditary or elective kingdoms under several constitutions and manners, according as chance, contrivance, or occasions happen to mold them. But if princes have their titles in the father's right, and it be a sufficient proof of the natural right of fathers to political authority, because they commonly were those in whose hands we find, de facto, the exercise of government, I say, if this argument be good, it will as strongly prove that all princes, nay, princes only, ought to be priests, since it is as certain that in the beginning, quote, the father of the family was priest, as that he was ruler in his own household. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Sections 77 through 86. Chapter 7 Political or Civil Society. Conjugal Society. Section 77. God having made man as a creature who, in God's own judgment, ought not to be alone, drew him strongly by need, convenience, and inclination into society and equipped him with understanding and language to keep society going and to enjoy it. The first society was between man and wife, which gave rise to the society between parents and children, to which, in time, the society between master and servant came to be added. All these could and often did meet together, and constitute a single family in which the master or mistress had some appropriate sort of authority. Each of these smaller societies, or all together, fell short of being a political society, as we shall see if we consider the different ends, ties, and bounds of each of them. Section 78. Conjugal society is made by a voluntary compact between man and woman. It mainly consists in the togetherness of bodies and right of access to one another's bodies that is needed for procreation which is its main purpose. But it brings with it mutual support and assistance, and a togetherness of interests, too, this being needed to unite their care and affection, and also needed by their offspring, who have a right to be nourished and maintained by them till they are old enough to provide for themselves. Section 79. The purpose of bonding between male and female is not just procreation, but the continuation of the species, meaning that it's not just to have children, but to bring them up. So this link between male and female ought to last beyond procreation, so long as is needed for the nourishment and support of the young ones. This rule that our infinite wise maker has imposed on his creatures can be seen to be regularly obeyed by the lower animals. In viviparous animals that feed on grass, the bonding of male with female lasts no longer than the mere act of copulation. Because the female's teat is sufficient to nourish the young until they can feed on grass, all the male has to do is beget, 
and doesn't concern himself with the female or with the young, to whose nourishment he can't contribute anything. But in beasts of prey, the conjunction lasts longer. Because the dam isn't able to survive and to nourish her numerous offspring by her own prey alone, this being a more laborious way of living than feeding on grass, as well as a more dangerous one. So the male has to help to maintain their common family, which can't survive unaided until the young are able to prey for themselves. This can be seen also with birds, whose young need food in the nest, so that the cock and the hen continue as mates until the young can fly, and can provide for themselves. The only exception is some domestic birds. The cock needn't feed and take care of the young brood because there is plenty of food. Section 80 This brings us to what I think is the chief, if not the only reason, why the human male and female are bonded together for longer than other creatures. It is this. Long before a human child is able to shift for itself, without help from his parents. Its mother can again conceive and bear another child, so that the father, who is bound to take care for those he has fathered, is obliged to continue in conjugal society with the same woman for longer than some other creatures. With creatures whose young can make their own way, the time of procreation comes around again. The conjugal bond automatically dissolves and the parents are at liberty, till Hymen, at his usual anniversary season, summons them again to choose new mates. We have to admire the wisdom of the great creator. Having given man foresight and an ability to make preparations for the future, as well dealing with present needs, God made it necessary that the society of man and wife should be more lasting than that of male and female among other creatures, so that their industry might be encouraged and their interests better united, to make provision and lay up goods for their shared offspring, an arrangement that would be mightily disturbed if the offspring had an uncertain mixture of parentage, or if conjugal society were often and easily dissolved. Section 81 But though there are ties that make conjugal bonds firmer and more lasting in humans than in the other species of animals, it is still reasonable to ask, once procreation and upbringing have been secured, and inheritance arranged for, why shouldn't this compact between man and wife be like any other voluntary compact? That is, why shouldn't its continuance depend on the consent of the parties, or on the elapsing of a certain period of time, or on some other condition? It is a reasonable question because neither the compact itself nor the purposes for which it was undertaken require that it should always be for life, unless, of course, there is a positive law ordaining that all such contracts be perpetual. Section 82. Though the husband and wife have a single common concern, they have different views about things, and so inevitably they will sometimes differ in what they want to be done. The final decision on any practical question has to rest with someone and it naturally falls to the man's share, because he is the abler and the stronger of the two. But this applies only to things in which they have a common interest or ownership. It leaves the wife in the full and free possession of what by contract is her special right, and gives the husband no more power over her life than she has over his. The husband's power is so far from that of an absolute monarch that the wife is in many cases free to separate from him, where natural right or their contract allows it. Whether that contract is made by themselves in the state of nature, or made by the customs or laws of the country they live in. When such a separation occurs, the children go to the father or to the mother, depending on what their contract says. Section 83. All the purposes of marriage can be achieved under political government as well as in the state of nature. So the civil magistrate doesn't interfere with any of the husband's or wife's rights or powers that are naturally necessary for those purposes, namely procreation and mutual support and assistance while they are together. He comes into the picture only when called upon to decide any controversy that may arise between man and wife about the purposes in question. If it were otherwise, and that absolute sovereignty and power of life and death naturally belonged to the husband, and were necessary to the society between man and wife, 
there could be no matrimony in any of those countries where the husband is allowed no such absolute authority. But the ends of matrimony requiring no such power in the husband, the condition of conjugal society put it not in him, it being not at all necessary to that state. Conjugal society could subsist and attain its ends without it. Nay, community of goods, and the power over them, mutual assistance and maintenance, and other things belonging to conjugal society, might be varied and regulated by that contract which unites man and wife in that society, as far as may consist with procreation and the bringing up of children, till they could shift for themselves, nothing being necessary to any society that is not necessary to the ends for which it is made. Section 84. As for the society between parents and children, and the distinct rights and powers belonging to each, I discussed this fully enough in chapter 6, and needn't say more about it here. I think it is obvious that it is very different from politic society. Section 85. Master and servant are names as old as history, but very different relationships can be characterized by them. A free man may make himself a servant to someone else by selling to him for a specified time the service that he undertakes to do, in exchange for wages he is to receive. This often puts him into the household of his master and under its ordinary discipline, but it gives the master a power over him that is temporary and is no greater than what is contained in the contract between them. But there is another sort of servant to which we give the special name slave. A slave is someone who, being a captive taken in a just war, is by the right of nature subjected to the absolute command and arbitrary power of his master. A slave has forfeited his life and with it his liberty. He has lost all his goods, and as a slave he is not capable of having any property, so he can't in his condition of slavery be considered as any part of civil society, the chief purpose of which is the preservation of property. Section 86. Let us then consider a master of a family, with all these subordinate relations of wife, children, servants, and slaves, all brought together under the general label of the domestic rule of a family. This may look like a little commonwealth in its structure and rules, but it is really far from that in its constitution, its power, and its purpose. Or if it must be thought a monarchy, and the paterfamilias, the absolute monarch in it, absolute monarchy will have but a very shattered and short power, when it is plain, by what has been said before, that the master of the family has a very distinct and differently limited power, both as to time and extent, over those several persons that are in it. For excepting the slave, and the family is as much a family, and his power as paterfamilias as great, whether there be any slaves in his family or no, he has no legislative power of life and death over any of them, and none too but what a mistress of a family may have as well as he. And he certainly can have no absolute power over the whole family, who has but a very limited one over every individual in it. But how a family, or any other society of men, differ from that which is properly political society, we shall best see by considering wherein political society itself consists. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Sections 87 through 94. Section 87. As I have shown, man was born with a right to perfect freedom, 
and with an uncontrolled enjoyment of all the rights and privileges of the law of nature, equally with any other man or men in the world. So he has by nature a power not only to preserve his property, that is, his life, liberty, and possessions, against harm from other men, but to judge and punish breaches of the law of nature by others, punishing in the manner he thinks the offense deserves, even punishing with death crimes that he thinks are so dreadful as to deserve it. But no political society can exist or survive without having in itself the power to preserve the property, and therefore to punish the offenses, of all the members of that society. And so there can't be a political society except where every one of the members has given up this natural power, passing it into the hands of the community in all cases, with all private judgments of every particular member of the society being excluded. The community comes to be the umpire. It acts in this role according to settled standing rules, impartially, the same to all parties, acting through men who have authority from the community to apply those rules. This umpire settles all the disputes that may arise between members of the society concerning any matter of right, and punishes offenses that any member has committed against the society, with penalties that the law has established. This makes it easy to tell who are and who aren't members of a political society. Those who are united into one body with a common established law and judiciary to appeal to, with authority to decide controversy and punish offenders, are in civil society with one another. Whereas those who have no such common appeal, I mean no such appeal here on earth, are still in the state of nature, each having to judge and to carry out the sentence because there isn't anyone else to do those things for him. Section 88. That's how it comes about that the commonwealth has the power of making laws, that is, the power to set down what punishments are appropriate for what crimes that members of the society commit, and the power of war and peace, that is, the power to punish any harm done to any of its members by anyone who isn't a member. All this being done for the preservation of the property of all the members of the society, as far as is possible, every man who has entered into civil society has thereby relinquished his power to punish offenses against the law of nature on the basis of his own private judgment, giving it to the legislature in all cases. And along with that, he has also given to the commonwealth a right to call on him to employ his force for the carrying out of its judgments, which are really his own judgments, for they are made by himself or by his representative. So we have the distinction between the legislative and executive powers of civil society. The former are used to judge, by standing laws, how far offenses committed within the commonwealth are to be punished. The latter are used to determine by occasional judgments based on particular circumstances, how far harms from outside the commonwealth are to be vindicated. Each branch of a commonwealth's power can employ all the force of all its members when there is a need for it. Section 89. Thus, there is a political or civil society. When and only when a number of men are united into one society in such a way that each of them forgoes his executive power of the law of nature, giving it over to the public. And this comes about wherever a number of men in the state of nature enter into society to make one people, one body politic, under one supreme government. A man can become a member of a commonwealth without being in on its creation namely, when someone joins himself to a commonwealth that is already in existence. In doing this, he authorizes the society, that is, authorizes its legislature, to make laws for him as the public good of the society shall require. This takes men out of a state of nature into the state of a commonwealth, 
by setting up a judge on earth with authority to settle all the controversies and redress the harms that are done to any member of the commonwealth. Any group of men who have no such decisive power to appeal to are still in the state of nature, no matter what other kind of association they have with one another. Section 90. This makes it evident that absolute monarchy, which some people regard as the only genuine government in the world, is actually inconsistent with civil society and so can't be a form of civil government at all. Consider what civil society is for. It is set up to avoid and remedy the drawbacks of the state of nature that inevitably follow from every man's being judge in his own case, by setting up a known authority to which every member of that society can appeal when he has been harmed or is involved in a dispute, an authority that everyone in the society ought to obey. So any people who don't have such an authority to appeal to for the settlement of their disputes are still in the state of nature. Thus, every absolute monarch is in the state of nature with respect to those who are under his dominion. Section 91. For an absolute monarch is supposed to have both legislative and executive power in himself alone. So there is no judge or court of appeal that can fairly, impartially, and authoritatively make decisions that could provide relief and compensation for any harm that may be inflicted by the monarch or on his orders. So such a man, call him czar, or grand senior, or what you will, is as much in the state of nature with respect to his subjects as he is with respect to the rest of mankind. This is a special case of the state of nature, because between it and the ordinary state of nature there is this difference, a woeful one for the subject, really, the slave, of an absolute monarch. In the ordinary state of nature a man is free to judge what he has a right to, and to use the best of his power to maintain his rights, whereas in an absolute monarchy, when his property is invaded by the will of his monarch, he not only has no one to appeal to, but he isn't even free to judge what his rights are, or to defend them, as though he were a cat or a dog that can't think for itself. He is, in short, exposed to all the misery and inconveniences that a man can fear from someone who is in the unrestrained state of nature, and is also corrupted with flattery, and armed with power. Section 92. If you think that absolute power purifies men's blood and corrects the baseness of human nature, read history, of this or any other age, and you'll be convinced of the contrary. A man who would have been insolent and injurious in the forests of America isn't likely to be much better on a throne, possibly even worse because as an absolute monarch he may have access to learning and religion that will justify everything he does to his subjects, and the power of arms to silence immediately all those who dare question his actions. For what the protection of absolute monarchy is, what kind of fathers of their countries it makes princes to be, and to what a degree of happiness and security it carries civil society, where this sort of government is grown to perfection, he that will look into the late relation of Ceylon may easily see. Section 93. In absolute monarchies, as well in other governments in the world, the subjects can appeal to the law and have judges to decide disputes and restrain violence among the subjects, Everyone thinks this to be necessary, and believes that anyone who threatens it should be thought a declared enemy to society and mankind. But does this come from a true love of mankind and society, and from the charity that we all owe to one another? There is reason to think that it doesn't. There is really no more to it than what any man who loves his own power, profit, or greatness will naturally do to prevent fights among animals that labor and drudge purely for his pleasure and advantage, and so are taken care of 
not out of any love the master has for them, but out of the love for himself and for the profit they bring him. If we ask, what security, what fence do we have to protect us from the violence and oppression of this absolute ruler? The very question is found to be almost intolerable. They are ready to tell you that even to ask about safety from the monarch is an offense that deserves to be punished by death. Between subjects, they will grant there must be measures, laws, and judges to produce mutual peace and security. But the ruler ought to be absolute and is above all such considerations. Because he has power to do more hurt and wrong, it is right when he does it. To ask how you may be guarded from harm coming from the direction where the strongest hand is available to do it is to use the voice of faction and rebellion. As if when men left the state of nature and entered into society, they agreed that all but one of them should be under the restraint of laws, and that one should keep all the liberty of the state of nature, increased by power and made licentious by impunity. This implies that men are so foolish that they would take care to avoid harms from polecats or foxes, but think it is safety to be eaten by lions. Section 94. But whatever may be soothingly said to confuse people's understandings, it doesn't stop men from feeling. And when they see that any man is outside the bounds of the civil society to which they belong, and that they have no appeal on earth against any harm he may do them, they are apt to think they are in the state of nature with respect to that man, and to take care as soon as possible to regain the safety and security in civil society, which was their only reason for entering into it in the first place. This holds for any such man, whatever his station in life, whether he is a monarch or a street sweeper. In the early stages of a commonwealth, it may happen this being something I shall discuss more fully later on, that one good and excellent man comes to be preeminent, his goodness and virtue causing the others to defer to him as to a kind of natural authority, so that by everyone's tacit consent he comes to be the chief arbitrator of their disputes, with no precautions taken against his abusing that power, except their confidence in his uprightness and wisdom. The story could unfold from there in the following way. The careless and unforeseeing innocence of the first years of society, which I have been describing, establish customs of deference to one individual. Some of the successors to the first preeminent man are much inferior to him, but the passage of time gives authority to customs, some say it makes them sacred, and so the custom of deference to one stays in place. Eventually, the people find that, although the whole purpose of government is the preservation of property, their property is not safe under this government. And they conclude that the only way for them to be safe and without anxiety, the only way for them to think they are in a civil society, is for the legislative power to be given to a collective body of men. Call it Senate, Parliament, or what you will. In this way, every single person, from the highest to the lowest, comes to be subject to the laws that he himself, as part of the legislature, has established. No one has authority to take himself outside the reach of a law once it has been made, nor can anyone by any claim of superiority plead exemption from the laws, so as to license offenses against it by himself or his dependents. No man in civil society can be exempted from its laws, for if any man can do what he thinks fit, and there is no appeal on earth for compensation or protection against any harm he may do, isn't he still perfectly in the state of nature, and so not a part or member of that civil society? The only way to avoid the answer yes is to say that the state of nature and civil society are one and the same thing and I have never yet found anyone who is such an enthusiast for anarchy that he would affirm that. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, 
which will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. John Locke, Second Treatise of Government, Chapter 8, Of the Beginning of Political Societies, Sections 95 through 105. Section 95. Men being, as has been said, by nature all free, equal, and independent, no one can be put out of this estate and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The only way whereby any one divests himself of his natural liberty and puts on the bonds of civil society is by agreeing with other men to join and unite into a community for their comfortable, safe, and peaceable living, one amongst another, in a secure enjoyment of their properties, and a greater security against any that are not of it. This any number of men may do, because it injures not the freedom of the rest. They are left as they were in the liberty of the state of nature. When any number of men have so consented to make one community or government, they are thereby presently incorporated and make one body politic, wherein the majority have a right to act and conclude the rest. Section 96. For when any number of men have, by the consent of every individual, made a community, they have thereby made that community one body, with a power to act as one body, which is only by the will and determination of the majority. For that which acts any community, being only the consent of the individuals of it, and it being necessary to that which is one body to move one way, it is necessary the body should move that way whether the greater force carries it, which is the consent of the majority, or else it is impossible it should act or continue one body, one community, which the consent of every individual that united into it agreed that it should. And so every one is bound by that consent to be concluded by the majority. And therefore we see that in assemblies, empowered to act by positive laws, where no number is set by that positive law which empowers them, the act of the majority passes for the act of the whole, and of course determines, as having, by the law of nature and reason, the power of the whole. Section 97. And thus every man, by consenting with others to make one body politic under one government, puts himself under an obligation to every one of that society to submit to the determination of the majority, and to be concluded by it. Or else this original compact, whereby he with others incorporates into one society, would signify nothing, and be no compact if he be left free and under no other ties than he was in before in the state of nature. For what appearance would there be of any compact? What new engagement if he were no further tied by any decrees of the society than he himself thought fit and did actually consent to? This would be still as great a liberty as he himself had before his compact or anyone else in the state of nature half who may submit himself and consent to any acts of it if he thinks fit. Section 98. For if the consent of the majority shall not, in reason, be received as the act of the whole, and conclude every individual, nothing but the consent of every individual can make anything to be the act of the whole. But such a consent is next to impossible ever to be had. If we consider the infirmities of health and avocations of business, which in a number, though much less than that of a commonwealth, will necessarily keep many away from the public assembly, to which, if we add the variety of opinions and contrariety of interests, which unavoidably happen in all collections of men, 
The coming into society upon such terms would be only like Cato's coming into the theater, only to go out again. Such a constitution as this would make the mighty Leviathan of a shorter duration than the feeblest creatures, and not let it outlast the day it was born in, which cannot be supposed, till we can think that rational creatures should desire and constitute societies only to be dissolved. For where the majority cannot conclude the rest, there they cannot act as one body, and consequently will be immediately dissolved again. Section 99. Whosoever, therefore, out of a state of nature unite into a community, must be understood to give up all the power necessary to the ends for which they unite into society, to the majority of the community, unless they expressly agreed in any number greater than the majority. And this is done by barely agreeing to unite into one political society, which is all the compact that is or needs be between the individuals that enter into or make up a commonwealth. And thus, that which begins and actually constitutes any political society is nothing but the consent of any number of free men capable of a majority to unite and incorporate into such a society. And this is that, and that only, which did or could give beginning to any lawful government in the world. Section 100. To this, I find two objections made. First, that there are no instances to be found in story of a company of men independent and equal one amongst another that met together and in this way began and set up a government. Secondly, it is impossible of right that men should do so, because all men being born under government, they are to submit to that and are not at liberty to begin a new one. Section 101. To the first, there is this to answer, that it is not at all to be wondered that history gives us but a very little account of men that live together in the state of nature. The inconveniences of that condition, and the love and want of society, no sooner brought any number of them together, but they presently united and incorporated, if they designed to continue together. And if we may not suppose men ever to have been in the state of nature, because we hear not much of them in such a state, we may as well suppose the armies of Salmanasser or Xerxes were never children, because we hear little of them till they were men, and embodied in armies. Government is everywhere antecedent to records, and letters seldom come in amongst a people till a long continuation of civil society has, by other more necessary arts, provided for their safety, ease, and plenty. And then they begin to look after the history of their founders, and search into their original, when they have outlived the memory of it. For it is with commonwealths as with particular persons. They are commonly ignorant of their own births and infancies. And if they know anything of their original, they are beholden for it, to the accidental records that others have kept of it. And those that we have of the beginning of any policies in the world, excepting that of the Jews, where God himself immediately interposed, and which favors not at all paternal dominion, are all either plain instances of such a beginning as I have mentioned, or at least have manifest footsteps of it. Section 102. He must show a strange inclination to deny evident matter of fact, when it agrees not with his hypothesis who will not allow that the beginning of Rome and Venice were by the uniting together of several men free and independent one of another, amongst whom there was no natural superiority or subjection. And if Josephus Acosta's word may be taken, he tells us that in many parts of America there was no government at all. There are great and apparent conjectures, says he, that these men, speaking of those of Peru, for a long time had neither kings nor commonwealths, but lived in troops, as they do this day in Florida, the Chiricanas, those of Brazil, and many other nations, which have no certain kings, but as occasion is offered, in peace or war, they choose their captains as they please. If it be said that every man there was born subject to his father, or the head of his family, that the subjection due from a child to a father took not away his freedom of uniting into what political society he thought fit, 
has been already proved. But be that as it will, these men, it is evident, were actually free. And whatever superiority some politicians now would place in any of them, they themselves claimed it not, but by consent were all equal, till by the same consent they set rulers over themselves, so that their politic societies all began from a voluntary union, and the mutual agreement of men freely acting in the choice of their governors and forms of government. Section 103. And I hope those who went away from Sparta with Palantus, mentioned by Justin, will be allowed to have been free men independent one of another, and to have set up a government over themselves by their own consent. Thus I have given several examples out of history of people free and in the state of nature, that being met together incorporated and began a commonwealth. And if the want of such instances be an argument to prove that government were not, nor could not be so begun, I suppose the contenders for paternal empire were better let it alone than urge it against natural liberty. For if they can give so many instances out of history of governments begun upon paternal right, I think, though at best an argument from what has been to what should of right be, has no great force, one might, without any great danger, yield them the cause. But if I might advise them in the case, they would do well not to search too much into the original of governments, as they have begun de facto, lest they should find, at the foundation of most of them, something very little favorable to the design they promote, and such a power as they contend for. Section 104 But to conclude, reason being plain on our side, that men are naturally free, and the examples of history showing that the governments of the world that were begun in peace had their beginning laid on that foundation and were made by the consent of the people. There can be little room for doubt, either where the right is or what has been the opinion or practice of mankind about the first erecting of governments. Section 105 I will not deny that if we look back as far as history will direct us, towards the original of commonwealths, we shall generally find them under the government and administration of one man. And I am also apt to believe that where a family was numerous enough to subsist by itself and continued entire together without mixing with others, as it often happens, where there is much land and few people, the government commonly began in the father. For the father having, by the law of nature, the same power with every man else to punish, as he thought fit, any offenses against that law, might thereby punish his transgressing children, even when they were men, and out of their pupilage, and they were very likely to submit to his punishment, and all join with him against the offender in their turns giving him thereby power to execute his sentence against any transgression, and so, in effect, making him the lawmaker and governor over all that remained in conjunction with his family. He was fittest to be trusted. Paternal affection secured their property and interest under his care, and the custom of obeying him in their childhood made it easier to submit to him rather than to any other. If, therefore, they must have one to rule them, as government is hardly to be avoided amongst men that live together. Who so likely to be the man as he that was their common father? Unless negligence, cruelty, or any other defect of mind or body made him unfit for it. But when either the father died and left his next heir for want of age, wisdom, courage, or any other qualities less fit for rule, or where several families met and consented to continue together. There, it is not to be doubted, but they used their natural freedom to set up him whom they judged the ablest and, most likely, to rule well over them. Conformable hereunto, we find the people of America, who, living out of the reach of the conquering swords and spreading domination of the two great empires of Peru and Mexico, enjoyed their own natural freedom, though Ceteris Paribus, 
they commonly prefer the heir of their deceased king. Yet if they find him any way weak or incapable, they pass him by, and set up the stoutest and bravest man for their ruler. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. <laughs>